Hello, my name is Benjamin Verdos, and I work uh, as the head of music at Sync Floor. It's a commercial marketplace for high quality uh, commercial music from labels, publishers, and distributors. Um, we have a great panel here today on a, a, a pretty important topic, and so we'll just start. I'll let I'll let y'all introduce yourselves. Maybe we'll start with Logan and work your way over here. But um, yeah, take it away. Um, I'm Logan. I work at Reach Records. It's a hip hop uh, label out of Atlanta, started by Lecrae, and I do our um, music licensing, director of music licensing, if you want to go there. <laughs> so that's what I do. I'm Anna. I work for Big Sync. I'm a music supervisor. I work with brands and ad agencies, mostly on helping them develop music strategies for their campaigns. So a lot of commercial music licensing and original composition creations. Dan Korobkin, Source Audio. I'm a founding partner, president of sales. And prior to that, I was a VP of post-production and a music supervisor at Creative Domain and Trailer Park. Hey everyone, my name is Katrina Balsius. I'm head of sales at Disco. We are a workflow and productivity tool that the majority of the sync industry uses to manage their catalogs, receive music, tag music, create playlists, and send it out for licensing opportunities. Great, awesome, thanks for being here. Uh, so we'll jump right in. I don't have like an intro speech, just gonna hit the question. So um, branded content and UGC user generated content have seen a massive surge in the era of YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. How can indie artists and labels use tech to monetize in this space? Uh, so we'll actually start. Yeah. Well, I'm noticing with a lot of clients that I work with on the music supervision side of things, and I know Anna's gonna talk about this a little bit, but um, most music supervisors use disco to house their music library. And as I mentioned, a lot of rights holders use Disco as well. So what supervision companies are doing is when they're working with certain brand and agency partners, they're starting to service them by aggregating music in Disco in a branded interface and in like a searchable library to give to them. So it's really interesting to see more of this highly curated approach and with supervisors being able to access music within the ecosystem that they're already in, that really elevates your chances of having that music be available for licensing for brands. So um, definitely being where the buyers are kind of helps. So yeah, that's one way. We'll just go right down the line if that works. Okay, um, yes, thank you. Um, there are two sides to the revenue stream for user generated content. That's the licensing side. And of course, for like YouTube, there's a content ID side where you're generating revenue from the ads that are being placed. So it's important to get involved in both of those streams. Source Audio currently has a partnership with A2IM where we're creating a large aggregated content library or catalog of as many labels that want to join as possible. And they're making that available you know, for micro licensing, for blanket licensing, all sorts of licensing in the, in the arena. And then with Source Audio, you can join a content ID program, which is generating revenue from the clicks and views on YouTube. So that's another great area to get into, to use technology, e-commerce, get your music out there, super important. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And um, for those who you don't know, Big Sync is owned by a parent company, Song Trader, who does very similar sort of things. And yeah, just a great opportunity to just find new revenue streams for mm -hmm. artists, people who have built partnerships with just these new types of monetization streams as far as apps, games, platforms, YouTube content ID. Um, yeah, just a lot of the new sources that are out there. Um, it's just, it's, it's great that there, are, that there are platforms that artists can opt their music into now and just see a lot of new types of streams in that regard. And um, the, the thing that I think is good to remember is that having your music in those sort of additional revenue streams really does not impact your ability to land stake licenses as well. So you are still gonna be able to, to have needle drop opportunities, be able to land some more major placements alongside of those. So really having your music in those different types of pools is all just more, more money in general. And what Katrina was saying uh, as well with the disco is that I use 
that platform so much for for getting music out to my clients and so branded content in general there's such a need for it and being able to have well curated content that i can be sending out to to the agencies and the brands that i work with disco's done a great job of being able to really kind of help that be organized and make it more user facing and so having a really nice looking platform that people can access music from yeah uh, I would agree, one hundred percent. I think, um, yeah, if you're not using something that aims towards sync, if you're still using like Box or Dropbox or like Google Drive, it's so hard to like send playlists to people. Um, so I definitely encourage that. Um, but yeah, I mean, for you know the label side, I've definitely seen. Um, you know, we, we had a song that went on IG Reels and like really, you know, did well last year. And just seeing that like, the more eyeballs on it, the more obviously people want to reach out for sync. And so um, I think there's, there's that side of things, but then there's also just like making sure that like, you know, all the metadata and all the, like everything is cleared and having the ability to like put that info just straight in there into disco or whatever um, you use, like that is like just so important, at least from what I've seen from the music, like supervisor side, they're always like, you know, if you have emails, if you have all these different things that like can directly connect with, you know, the writers or producers, um, that just like helps their job, you know, hopefully. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and even just like, placing your, making sure that your music is in all the right spots. Like, um, we're even coming up to like, uh, music reports is kind of like a, a clearance spot for like Peloton and like Apple Fitness. And um, there's a company called Lick that does like, you know, micro licenses for YouTube. And like issues we're running into is like, you know, making sure that all the publishing side is cleared. Like you can clear the master side as like a label, but like, um, you know, there's also like, kind of like educating these like writers and producers that there's like other opportunities. And so, um, you know, maybe figuring out like how to, you know, use those platforms to, you know, get clearances. Cool, yeah, thank you. And I'm just gonna take it a little step further just cause we were chatting earlier about um, just like, who has access to certain things, right? So like using a, a song trader, using, you know, a source audio, using to get, you know, like certain independent artists don't have quite those links yet. Mm -hmm. And and that, that's why those, and just to clarify why platforms, like I guess all of ours are, are important in creating a, a connection to between the independent artist label to get to those, what, what like are being described as like these uh, dedicated library type things that the, the criteria. So I thought I'd let you maybe talk just a little bit about that, like the some of what you see from those TikTok, like branded content type situations, you know, like what, what they want from their end or what, what, you know, also like what agencies are looking for. Yeah. Well, I'll probably let Anna take that one <laughs> since that's her wheelhouse, obviously. But what I can say about what you're talking about is that independent artists, producers, labels, you'll start in disco. That's where you're going to start, where you're going to house your whole catalog. And to Logan's point, you ha and sorry for the broken record, but you need to hear it. Having your metadata up to date is so, so crucial. So you can kind of have that whole workflow be in disco first. Um, and we also, I think we're going to get into some AI technology, which disco does have AI tagging, which helps just create a consistent language and sometimes people a little too close to their music and they'll over tag. So having an AI do that can really help, but just kind of having disco be your home base to then get your ducks in a row. You have the metadata, you have the formats available, you have your presentation, then you can present it out to send it to Anna to pitch for different brand partnerships or TikTok is a customer of ours and they're aggregating the library for some of their partners that they work with and giving their internal marketing team access to that. Um, or using Syncfloor, of course, for micro licensing. Or maybe you want to go to Source Audio because you guys have a lot of blanket deals with networks and there's opportunities there. So, yeah. yeah. 
just go home base and then <laughs> you can go send it out. Yeah, and that's exactly right. You know, anything that can be done ahead of time, by the time the music gets to me, and especially advertising in particular, there's just not a lot of extra time. It's very tight deadlines. A lot of the work that I do is on different time zones as well. So that takes that takes time away too. So anything that, that can just get the music fully metadata tagged, fully understanding of whether or not it's a one stop, and if not, how complex is the clearance process going to be, being able to have all of that listed out in your music, stored in, in disco or, or source audio, wherever the case may be. And yeah, knowing that once I've found a track that I like, I know exactly where to go to clear it, how involved it's going to be, and knowing that there won't be a lot of friction from it. Yeah, don't be afraid to put your, your content in several different areas, yeah. as we're yeah. saying, mm -hmm. yeah. um, because it's important, whereas one platform may service one sector of the business, another may well, service another. Um, but when it comes to things like content ID with YouTube, you need to make sure that you're registered with one company and one company only, only because Google does not like clashes on content ID and mm -hmm. you know, get your stuff mm -hmm. tossed out. That's why, you know, a lot of times with our content ID program, you can, you know, allow list your music yourself. If it's registered with someone else, you can you know, get it out of the system. It's very, very simple to do that. And we make it very easy for you guys to do that. Also, um, when talking about broadcasters, and clients and getting your music to them, um, you want to try and get it to as many people as possible, not just the soups. You want to get it to the editors, the production teams, in line. Get your music into the timeline, which is the Avid or the Final Cut Pro or the Adobe Premiere. Get your music in there any way you can. And, you know, Source Audio has sites set up with all the major broadcasters, a lot of major broadcasters, and we have hundreds and thousands of views, downloads every single day on all these different systems. So it's a matter of getting your music in those systems having it pushed out, and don't be afraid to use as many or all means possible to do that. And I think one thing that unites kind of the, this panel too is like, we could, I think we would all say that like, people are hungry for commercial music. Like there's a, there's a, there's a now a better means to get like high quality commercial music out from, oh, it's not just production mm -hmm. music that can be put easily into TikTok. Now there's an appetite in, a, in the means to, we're getting closer to be able to add volume, like yeah. get back yes. catalog from, from indie labels, get, you know, get that access. Yeah. yeah. So, the other thing I'll, oh, ahead. sorry. Go ahead. The other thing I'll add with access is, you know, we were mentioning how supervisors are making these libraries for their clients. Indie labels and artists can also make searchable libraries in disco, and it's baked into the ecosystem. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of the top music supervisors in the world that use it. And so if you can also have a presence there and kind of use it as like a discovery exposure or promotional tool, that's another really, really easy entry point um, for access to. Uh, I was going to say production music libraries have set the bar very, very low for ease of license, okay? <laughs> and we get a lot of talk from our clientele, how can we license indie music with the ease of which we're licensing production music, right? One stop shop is the word that they use. So we're constantly trying to find labels with indie music that will have the capabilities to license with that ease. We're trying to create that for our clientele. Yeah, cool. Um, so we'll jump on to the next thing is we kind of, not to beat a dead horse, but, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, one of the biggest advances in music tech is the ability to search catalogs using metadata, using tagging and, and then natural language search, AI type, um, tools. Um, so I just, you know, we'll let you, if there's anything you guys wanted to add to that, obviously feel free. I mean, we're like, Syncfloor is geared on natural language search, but I, I don't, I don't know the specifics of what some of y'all are doing, but if you wanted to talk about it real quick, feel free. Yeah. I mean, I would say just like the the faster you can find music, especially if it's like quick ad briefs or whatever comes through, like you want to be on top of it. Like you want to be in the inbox first. And so um, just being able to like have all your songs tagged, not only with the contact information or like who's the writer and how much percent um, is helpful to just like have what kind of mood, what kind of vibe is this? And and that way you can easily put it in a playlist to pitch out. Um, just because everything is so like time, time sensitive. Um, <clears throat> and so things like that just help, you know, you get in the hands of more people. Um, 
and just like, uh, yeah, it's it's just so helpful. <laughs> Can I follow up? What would be an example of like some themes that you found really important, or like some things, some tags, some some that you put on your your tracks that kind of that's that's a little more specific that's kind of helped helped you i mean i feel like we can all agree swagger is probably <laughs> it's never going away <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> uh just swagger i mean for us um we're mostly like hip-hop just we aim towards more like sports stuff and so finding the right kind of like tags that work for that um you know and so like upbeat but also like you know, more aggressive or upbeat and more happy, or like, you know, just trying to figure out like what um, is actually going to work for this brief versus like, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, searching the whole catalog. The other thing that's really crucial is BPM. Mm -hmm. Like, how many people actually put BPM on their songs? Oh, 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 okay. You guys are ahead of the game. Supervisors search BPM all the time. So really important that you have that on. Um, and Disco's AI is able to identify BPM. So basically, as soon as you upload music into Disco, it's going to tag it with moods and feels. It knows swagger. It knows emotive. It knows anthemic. So these kind of universal language that the sync community is used to searching for. Um, it will recognize genre, instruments, vocals, and tempo. So as I mentioned earlier, if you can just let AI do the bulk of that, and of course a human ear is need to, needs to go in and add some additional tags, but this will save hours and hours and hours That's and hours point. of work. That's yeah. B point. BPM is very yeah. handy in disco. Is what? Is very handy. Oh, yeah. yes. It's a yes. big, it's a really big <laughs> deal too. Just like, it might be interesting, is like um, when you, the trend in, in fitness using commercial music um, trainers really want that. And so that's been a big, oh, yeah. a big yeah. need as we've seen yeah. that space grow. You know, Peloton was like the, maybe the oh, first yeah. mover, but now we're seeing so many different things. So it's really important to have it. And if it's mm -hmm. not right to be able to change it so people can access it. We have two big clients who are looking for yeah. action, sports, workout music yeah. specifically. Yeah. Yeah. One thing is obviously none of us got into the business of music to sit in front of a spreadsheet all day and fill out cells and, you know, but, you know, you have to do it. You have to do it. However, you know, like on Source Audio, we have a tool called Sonic Search, which you don't have to have the BPM or any of the data in there. You can just upload any piece of music or find any piece of music, and it will match it to other pieces of music in the system based on the sonic nature of the, of the piece, the, the tempo. Uh, the timbre of the instruments, et cetera. So even if you don't have that data, you can match cues in, using AI technology mm -hmm. on Sonic Search on Source Audio. Yeah, and that's the type of thing that's very helpful for me in working with advertising. And mm -hmm. so many of the ads that we work with, we've spent a lot of time sitting down with them and identifying what their brand principles are, certain sonic identity factors that, you know, so there are a lot of brands where Dove, for example, is always going to be positive. It's always going to be uplift, uplifting. They always use acoustic elements. So a lot of those sort of things where you can, you know, if you can search by things like that, you can very quickly pull out a lot of a, a lot of music that's just never going to work for them, and and helps make sure that it's aligning with their brand. So though that sort of search functionality is just so important for what I do. Awesome, cool. I'm going to keep it with you and move into the next question if that's okay. Um, so. Um, Sync has steadily represented about 2 to 3% of the total industry revenue for recorded music over the last 10 years. It's a debated statistic. Um, but um, what, what can we do as a collective sync industry to grow that number and increase sync's impact within the broader music industry? And I, I wanted to start with you. Yeah. Um, and, and some of the emphasis is a, a bit of it about the dichotomy between commercial music and production music and, and maybe how that impacts some of these statistics or some of the way that people think about how the indi indies pull together to, yeah. so. Yeah, and I think you're exactly right when you touched on the fact that so many more people want to use, I hate using the word real music, but you know, yeah. artists who are making music for their own fans, their own demographics, not necessarily just production music. And a lot of what we do is encourage our clients to use these active musicians who are out there and building their own presence and connecting to fans in ways that the brands can sort of share in, in that. And so, yeah, there's, there's such a desire for working with more and more commercial music. Um, it's just, it is harder. It's 
there's always an element of risk a little bit more with that. You know, if you don't, if it's not wholly owned music, if you don't confidently know that all of the writer splits were figured out, that there wasn't a sample that somebody doesn't know where it came from. And, you know, so there are a lot of challenges with that. And so I don't know how much this answers the question necessarily, but if there were any sort of ways where you can sort of, um, you know, as, as an indie artist, label, publisher, composer, producer, whoever you might be, if there are more ways for music supervisors to very confidently be able to feel like they can use your music and not run into legal issues is something that we all need to consider. Yeah, I would say um, from the label side of things, um, try and encourage the artists <laughs> or like writers, whoever is making it, that they should stay away from giving somebody like 1% or like 4%. Or <laughs> Let me just tell you, that is the <laughs> hardest person to clear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, cause I mean, there's somebody that I am very familiar with uh, and like they have 1% on a song and they, you know, get these licenses for $10. And it's like, hey, like you still have to fill out the forms mm -hmm. and like do all this stuff. And so it's just like, it's honestly puts a burden on them as a writer and they're like, they're not gonna do it. And so either the song doesn't go all the way through or just just issues. Um, so I think that's that's one thing I would like to touch on. But, uh, and then secondly, like, I feel like I've, um, you know, we've worked with some other artists that are kind of more specifically in the sync space and are easy clears or something like that. Um, but I feel like a lot of the time, um, you know, a music supervisor will, will like, they'll lean towards it, but they're like, I want you know, like an artist artist. Um, and so what we've done a lot of the time is like collaborating with like our artists who are doing, you know, putting out albums, doing the whole thing, um, but collaborating with some of these artists who are like kind of specifically making sync. And that way the, you know, the sync artists are like, you know, um, is kind of gaining some, you know, some representation as like a real artist, but then they're also making music that like fits for sync. Um, Cause a lot of times like an artist can be like super stoked about making sync, but their like idea of what like actually works <laughs> doesn't always like fit. Um, and so getting them like to collaborate with um, you know, people who do really well in that space. And maybe it is like a composer or somebody, um, but yeah. Let me ask a question based on what you said. Um, as we said before, ease of licensing is extremely important in trying to increase that revenue and that percentage. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the uh, labels here, you may have 50% publishing of one piece of music and then 25 is somewhere else and 1% is somewhere else. But if you can get the admin rights to administrate 100% of the rights yeah. with those other entities, yeah. so that when the music soup comes to license the piece, all they have to do is go to one party, you have the administration rights for everything, and then you can go out to the other guys and negotiate the rate, whatever, most favored nations. You only have to do one call. Yeah. Yeah. That makes it a lot easier, and that will increase yeah. that percentage exponentially. It's a game changer. Like think, heading, heading towards that one stop. Like it, it, closer you can get to that, um, and I feel like People are throwing that term around, but it's increasingly becoming important. So someone said it in the last panel about saying, but it, it is truly worth being like, what can I do to make my catalog as one stop as possible? Mm -hmm. And then um, knowing how right. to communicate that to right. the to the supervisors as well, because there might be times where something is actually pretty easy to clear. But if I'm just going on the PROs and looking and I see 10 right. different songwriters and yeah, I don't know who half the email addresses yeah. are, I'm gonna assume the worst. Right. Yeah. Whereas that same track could appear on, a, on an easy clear or a one-stop playlist that I've maybe stored in disco and, and tagged that way or was presented that way. Um, yeah, so it's it's not only making that those relationships happen or making, um, you know, resolving that, but then also communicating that to people too. Yeah, a lot of our clients in Source Audio would use the metadata spreadsheet, create a custom field that says admin rights 100%. So the music supervisor is going down the list on Source Audio and says 100%, 100%. All right, I can get this cues licensed today. Yeah. 
which is yeah. fucking wild. Awesome. All right, well, let's, ju let's jump through a few more questions. Um, we did touch on it a bit, so if, if anyone, again, feels like so inclined, feel free to jump on it, but how, how is tech exposing back catalog to decent opportunities? I think we talked a little bit about making one things one thought, metadata, yeah. you know, so, but if there's something that anybody, I feel like we covered it, maybe? Well, we were talking <laughs> about this, a new, I'm, I, I think Audio Shake is represented at Indie Week, but Audio Shake is a really cool technology that's come out that is allowing for, you know, legacy back catalogs that maybe be, maybe don't have instrumentals or stems, and supervisors need stems and instrumentals all the time. And if you don't have those available, you can lose out on opportunities. So making new music, obviously, you can get the producer to bounce those out. But if they're not available, using technology like Audio Shake to get that out into a supervisor within a couple hours will really increase your chances. Awesome. Yeah, I, I remember having a meeting with a very large music publisher in North America. And they had, their quote was, 5% of our catalog generates 95% of our revenue. I'm like, well, what are you doing with the other 95% of your catalog? Where is it, where is it, how is it housed, and why can't people use that to generate more revenue? And it was all about metadata. They, they just could not tag it, they yeah. could not get it out. So again, tag it, get it out there, generate more revenue from all your back catalog, go to Audio Shake, get the vocals taken out so you have an instrumental version that can weave into the vocal version, yeah. and uh, you'll be off and running. Awesome, cool. Yeah, and it really is, you know, these sort of advancements in tech that make it where you can take on bigger catalogs. And I think about how there used to be a time that I would have to go to catalogs and say, hey, send me your top 20, top 50 tracks, I'll at least get a feel for what your music sounds like and then reach out to you with briefs directly if there's anything that might be a good fit. But there might be thousands of tracks that are that are great and are back catalog and are from, you know, different genres and sort of more niche areas that might actually be exactly what I need, but then I don't even have any idea that they have it because right. I can only listen to so much music at a time. Yeah. So any occasion where there's more search functionality and being able to open the doors to broader um, access to catalogs is, is a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and like like sync floor is kind of crazy because you like the natural language search aspect is like, I want aqua crunk with female vocals at this BPM, yeah, you, you know, and What's you can aqua exactly. That's <laughs> <laughs> that, that guy. Um, but yeah, just like micro genres, you could just go yeah. so deep um, if you're if you're if you're coding and your infrastructure is, is well built. Um, Wait, do you guys so. have AI plus human? Uh, we do, okay. we do, we got it both. Nice. <laughs> um, so we'll jump into, you know, it's a bit of a hot topic, a bit, a, a bit of a um, one that I think the sync industry is gonna wrestle with is NFTs. I'm personally very uh, curious about how these, uh, how NFTs are gonna play a role in sync and like how um, maybe some of your y'all's companies are looking at it or exploring or thinking about it. So um, well, I think who, I, who's I, I say y'all. Yeah, first. we'll start um, whoever feels the, the Yeah, we're not really getting into NFTs too. right now. Um, <laughs> we'll deal with clients who have NFTs as music files. Uh, one thing it may be useful for in the future, and this is going into the next question, is, mm -hmm. is you know, tracking licenses mm -hmm. and tracking syncs. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very, very new area. It's a new area for everything. And getting the understanding of what an NFT is and how it works and how it folds into blockchain technology is super difficult to get out there into the community. Um, and so it's going to be, I think it's still a couple of years off before it really impacts our industry, but maybe you guys feel otherwise. Well, I was talking to a friend the other day who is in sync licensing, and she was saying that they're starting to do licenses for NFTs because it's moving picture and it's audio, that's sync. Mm -hmm. So what's cool about it is obviously we said it's new, it's a little bit of the wild, wild west, but it's going to increase more revenue for artists. So like, that's what we want. Yeah. So we'll see how it pans out, but yeah. yeah. And it will be interesting to see how, what exactly it means as far as, you know, owning the audio file versus being able to control it or to be able to make sync decisions or licensing decisions around it. Very hard to say, but yeah, curious, excited. I think any occasion where we can speed up the process of figuring out who the rights holders are, using smart contracts to be able to really quickly um, get contracts over the line would all be things that we, we all very much need right now. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, we're getting thousands of uh, sync NFT, you know, requests. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think. Oh, I thought you were serious. Like, like you're like, not. Hey. Like what? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can't, you know, agree or I agree with everybody. Um, in just that it's it's such a new thing, but I think that like the blockchain, all these things are going to help with, you know, the licensing process and getting things like past, you know, the finish line. Do you have thoughts? I have many thoughts, but um, <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm, we're certainly exploring that space, and it's yeah. it's really interesting. I think there's a lot of implications. There's a lot of work to be done um, in that space, but um, I think for us, it's like t a toolkit, just like starting to to really understand what it means to serve our lab label ecosystem, because we have like 100 plus partners that yeah. may may want to be able to to explore that uh, additionally. So um, thank you for asking. Um, but the f final question, how are we doing on time? I want to make sure that we get audience um, participation. 10 minutes. 10 minutes? OK. So we'll do a lightning round. Um, and, and again, if only if you if you feel like you, you have something to say. Uh, I, I'm just curious, you know, all NFTs aside, 2023 Indie Week, 2025 Indie Week, is there something that's really exciting to you um, in the, that, like, you know, I like to hypothesize about what's going to happen, but do you have something that's interesting that you think we'll be talking about next year in the next couple of years that we haven't spoken about? Um, I would say that we're just now getting into like at most mixes. So like, um, you know, I think mixing your songs differently. And I think that I've talked with like some trailer houses and, um, that seems to be like a new way of like, you know, getting your music into a different space and kind of being the first is like, you know, maybe exploring different like ways to, you know, mix the audio to, you know, kind of get it in front of new people. And so that's one thing we're doing at least. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Cool. Yeah, and I have been introduced to a, um, a new sort of project management tool that's fully built for music supervision and being able to manage license that I'm very excited about and really doesn't exist um, in, in the space right now. So being able to see when songs were licensed, a lot of different attributes about the music, but then also when is the license up? What do the terms cover? If you're working on projects where a lot of different licenses are all kind of floating around, it can be very, very difficult to manage. And especially if you're a brand or an agency who has many projects across the board then to, um, yeah, ways to, to, to better project manage that, I think is gonna be important. Uh, something that isn't new for Source Audio, but might be new to the industry is watermarking, detection, uh, broadcast creation of cue sheets and distribution of cue sheets to PROs. So we have technology we've been working with for many years and working with major broadcasters on inserting inaudible watermarks into all the music, monitoring the stations, detecting those watermarks, mirroring that data with ASRUN data, generating cue sheets, directing them back to the broadcaster who can then submit them to the PROs. Doing all that without any manual contact whatsoever. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. I think looking forward, what does it look like? I mean, it's 2022 and we don't have one place to go to fi find accurate copyright information. I know a lot of people are trying to work on that, like a lot of cooks. So I'm hoping yeah. by next Indie Week, there's some Make it happen. more yeah, leeway there. I'll rec recuse myself. I've always wanted to say that <laughs> to a microphone. So, um, okay, we're gonna do audience uh, real quick. And by real quick, you can push it as far as we can go. <laughs> Hey everybody. Um, so I work in artist management and we rely like heavily on our, uh, you know, the teams that represent our masters as well as um, our publishers to like actually interface with supervisors. I'm curious if there's any technology that you feel on the artist level different from what we've already talked about that artists can be doing that we can encourage, encourage our artists to do that is helpful in this conversation. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Other than what we've spoken about and other than just general uh, education about how licenses work and how publishing works and all this stuff works, because that's also super important, just getting a general you know, view of the landscape so they know what they're dealing with. Uh, other technologies that can help artists. 
Hmm. They should have like a mandatory welcome packet from labels, arts managers. <laughs> this is what you need to do and you're required to go to these conferences if you're an artist. It's like, man, man you have to go to three a year. You know, it's an extremely, extremely touchy subject because if you look at the history of music in America and around, throughout the globe, the lack of knowledge on the artist side has always benefited the industry and the business side. That's always been a hair, you know, part of the music business. And so getting that erased and trying to go back in time and get more knowledge to the artists and the people who are making the music about the industry. You know, before I said no one, no one got in the music business to look at a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. No one really got in the music business to become a business person. But it, it's, you know, it's where it's at, education and knowing about it. And, and if you look at some of the, the greatest rock successes in the history of rock music and pop music, it's the people who learn about publishing early and you know, Herb Alpers and people like that who were really super, super successful, ultra successful. I think another thing you can do, Ari, hello, um, is, and you're probably already doing this, but at least in the sync space, supervisors really love working with managers because you guys can make things happen quickly. And so if you can create some sort of like presentation for your artists to give to supervisors in a really like elegant, like visually pleasing, easy to get the music. You can see what tour dates are happening. Supervisors also love free shows, so you, you know, send them there. Um, but, you know, in disco, you could create like, we have pages that are coming out and it's really just like an elevated EPK or one pager, but having those really visually pleasing, easy to access music that you can send out really goes a long way. Next, next question, we have time for a couple more, I think. Oh, okay, that makes it easy. Oh, <laughs> never mind, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Sarah. I work at Video. We're a music tech company. Uh, we power uh, labels and managers with the tools so they can go scale their business, kind of power the back end. Uh, I work in rights and publishing, and I recently started developing a sync arm because I realized there's, we're getting unsolicited quotes, so obviously why can't we be pitching? Um, it's just like found revenue. Um, but I am curious to know, obviously we're talking about AI, and you can put in a sound you want, a song that sounds like Kanye West, and it'll spit out songs in your catalog like that. Uh, do you think in the future, you know, eventually, like? we're not gonna be needed one day. Like AI is gonna take over and it's not gonna be a human process picking music anymore. Uh, supervisors are just gonna be able to find music by saying what they wanna hear and they just find it. I wouldn't worry about that as much in the music industry as I would like society in general. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's okay. it. We are not yeah, gonna be needed it. in about 20 yeah. years to do yeah. anything. Once we, f once we yeah. find the solution, that's when it all ends. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, uh, Something like Sync Floor, though, is you know certainly built around the idea that at scale, right, that you can come and type in what you're looking for and self-serve. So when I first used Airbnb, I was like, I'm not going to stay in someone's house. Um, yeah. But you know, yeah. there was at least a golden era of Air Airbnb where I, I was like, hell yeah, this saved me on tour. Or this saved me in this way. So I think for us, it's like giving uh, really a, a platform where people can come and find something. They really like. We have like Shabazz palaces, and so you can come, someone can come and look for that and find it and be like, dope. I'm gonna look through all their songs or their catalog and, and connect with the label that way. So I'm excited about uh, continuing for this space to grow where people can, supervisors can come find what they're looking for. And if they need assistance, yeah. then I'm sure that most, most of you know, these types of entities, entities can get them closer. So. You know, something I want to ask the soup, the soup is over here in the record label. Um, you know, you get a piece of music, it's three minutes, right? And someone sends you a playlist of 10. You're not going to listen to all three minutes of all the songs, right? Would, would some sort of AI technology help you find the spot of the song that you should be listening to that's going to draw your attention or that's an answer to the brief that you sent out? Mm -hmm. Like a tag here or we have marker points, like comment yeah. points yeah. on our stuff. I do like that a lot. I, th I think about that a lot. I am still kind of old school enough where I really like to kind of click around myself and mm -hmm. listen through things. Um, also have curation teams who sort of help be a another set of ears who can, who can vet things. So still a, a human element, but yeah, I mean, with the amount of content there is, the amount of new types of people who are needing to license music right now, it's just, it's, it's overwhelming, there's so much. And yeah, and kind of to answer your question as well, you know, I think we're probably a ways from losing our jobs. We probably all will, but <laughs> I think for a while it is just, I mean, we're, we need efficiencies and we yeah. need tools that are doing these things more than anything. And I think it's only gonna help get us caught up to where we really are right now. Yeah. And then I would say, as long as there's people involved of like, 
figuring out who gets what on the split side, like <laughs> we're always gonna need people there. Um, but I think that, yeah, I mean, I would love for some or music supervisors just to be able to find the tracks and license them and I not be involved. Like, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it's like, I always try to like help out and try to, you know, give them the contact information and try to email the writer again or whatever. Um, just cause yeah, you're interacting with people and it just takes time. Let me ask a Katrina question. Cause I get this a lot too, maybe you do. Hmm. We get like what's called, wait, we call it waveform envy. You know, a song comes up and you can see the waveform hmm. And the bigger the waveform, the fatter the mix, the bigger the brick, the more attention it may draw to a supervisor's eyes. And it's not even an oral situation. It's a completely visual situation. Yeah. I don't know. I get, the lot. I get that a lot. Do you experience that on disco? Well, we do have the waveform on the playlist, which, as we talked about, is really mm -hmm. helpful. So you can see, like, where is the drop going to be? Where is the right, building? Right, right. Um, and that helps tremendously as you're, yeah, you're looking at a whole playlist and you have a visual of the waveform. You can quickly go to the bits, but yeah. So it's important that, you know, you get those visual representations yeah. along with the metadata and all this, all this emotional, you know, that can't be defined necessarily by an AI, but there's an emotional reaction to seeing a waveform. There's an emotional reaction to seeing how yeah. long the track is and how wide the thing is. And all these things go into play. And when you send a playlist, you know, your first, your first cue is okay. Your second cue is a little bit better. Third cue is the one you want them to license. The fourth cue is horrible. Go you know, back to three and then you're, you're all these things playing that. I don't think AI is ever going to really be. Cause like AI, they don't have feelings. <laughs> Right? Yes. Well, that's what I'm saying. And they like, think yeah, they it's do. It's like music, like we love music because it makes us feel. And like you have to have that empathetic ear when you're pitching to sync. And robots can't do that. When, when, but when they robots, can help us a uh, little bit. When robots become the consumers, <laughs> now we're in trouble. Then we're yeah. in trouble. Just, I guess what you're recommending is just crush your tracks in mastering. <laughs> the, the next, the next sound war, uh, like volume war is now like because it wasn't that a big thing for a while. Yeah, just crush your tracks. If you Break it out, producers man. out there, just yeah. the limiter everything you can, just yeah. crank it so they look. Yeah, I like the like the really interesting, playful ones. Like, oh, just a little bit. big and small. Yeah. Anyway, thanks so much for uh, for coming to the panel. Uh, have a great rest of your time. Come talk to us. Thank you.